there will be two parts uh, in uh, my thought. The first uh, is more or less historical, uh, so it will touch the, the past time of this uh, question. And the second will be uh, about the present time, and there will be a link between, uh, let's say, past time and uh, present time. So let's start like this. The Latin word culture originally was a term exclusively used to name the occupation of peasants or what we call today agriculture. That is to say, culture originally was a word to name the labor of cultivating fields of cultivating the earth. In the second book of his Tusculan Disputations, Cicero, for the first time in history, uses the word culture figuratively when he says, I quote, as a field, though fertile, cannot yield a harvest without cultivation, no more can the mind without learning. But philosophy is the culture of the soul. It rolls out vices by the root, prepares the mind to receive seeds, and commits to it and, so to speak, sows in it what, when grown, may bear the most abundant fruit." <coughs> End of quote. The rural meaning of culture, in the sense of working the soil, here is transferred into the mental sphere, or more specifically, into the sphere of the soul, so that we could say, transferred from soil to soul. By this phrase, Cicero laid the foundation stone uh, to what we today uh, understand by culture, culture as a way of processing the soul to amply bear fruit. But in contrast to agriculture, which plows the ground, uses fertilizers and erases weeds, the culture of the soul is achieved by philosophy. No cultivated soul without philosophy. This does not mean that only philosophers may claim to have a cultivated soul. For as Cicero says himself in the same text, I uh, quote, yet in a busy career and in a military life, the few things are often of benefit and bear fruit, if not as much as can be reaped from the entire range of philosophy, yet sufficient to yield, in us, to yield us in some degree occasional relief from desire or grief or fear." End of quote. Nevertheless, the possibility of a limited knowledge in philosophy does not mean that a cultivated soul could do without philosophy. Philosophy remains necessary in any case, be it widespread, be it restricted. But not only with regard to the extent of philosophical education, there may be differences in the culture of the soul. Just as the soul of the fields is not one and the same, there also is a huge plurality of souls. And as for the seed which may be deployed on the soul, the situation is alike. That's to say that there are as much seeds as there are useful plants. Now, in so far as in their way a people or a community may have a soul, such souls are equally disposed to be cultivated. According to this, there is not only the philosophical fruit of relief from desire or grief or fear. There is another one which is less personal or individual, but in, the respects, but, but in, but in some respects, excuse me, rather political or commu communicative. In our text, Cicero said that he wants to, I quote, rouse those who are liberally educated to philosophize with reason and method, and at the same time, to consult elegance and diction in their discussions, considerations, or debates." End of quote. As a comprehensive education that is philosophically cultivated, copes with reason and method, it yields a considerable fruit, which is the capacity of clear considerations and prospective debates, a capacity that is supposed to be beneficial, namely, in any kind of negotiations. But as, important, uh, but as important the capacity of clear considerations and prospective debates may be for negotiations after Cicero, and not only after him, this capacity, 
may just not be acquired in the course of negotiations and busy activities themselves. The acquirement of such a knowledge needs its own time and attitude. However, as long as we are of the mind that the time which is not immediately spent on busy affairs is a kind of idle time, effectless and maybe even fruitless, as long as we think so, we ignore that the understanding of fundamental conditions and essential facts does even need this very time of non-occupation in business and thus need a time of being free to fathom out the specific constitution and circumstances of a particular matter in question. That is why Cicero asks his conversational partner with regard to his philosophical attitude, I quote, for what can I do better, especially now, that I am doing nothing? In other words, this means that what can I do better than to philosophize, especially now that I am doing nothing? In terms of business and negotiations, philosophy seems to be mere inactivity. What we call idle time or leisure, the Romans called otium, otium. After Cicero, and not only after him, otium is a prerequisite mainly for philosophical instructed culture of the soul. Now if today we bow to the constraints of business, competition and negotiation, and by this ignore the objective need of leisure, or rather otium, this should not only be uh, traced back to superficiality, because negotiation is itself a denial of leisure, as the word says itself, a denial of otium. Let's listen. Negotiation. Neg, negotiation. Nec, otio. Nec, otium. No, otium. No, leisure. Negotiation means no leisure. The Romans, as well as the Greek, conceived the busy activity of negotiation as a denial of a free space and time for fathoming out the specific constitution and circumstances of decisive concerns. While negotiating, we may pass over the fundamental importance philosophical use of leisure has in particular for crucial negotiations. Hence, it would be necessary, at least sometimes, to change our perspective. So, when the time, while doing nothing, in the sense of common daily activities, when this time is free for another, a different minded occupation, what then are those occupations heading for? Again, otium or leisure here is a withdrawal from busy negotiations, whereby the fundament and essence of the things of daily commerce and communication may appear as such, that is to say, not masked by the constraints of business, competition, and similar phenomena. This is indeed quite a special approach. And uh, it would be interesting to see in which sense philosophy, philosophers, namely out of their withdrawal from daily business, may reveal aspects of very business. And it would be interesting too to what extent such deeper insights are supposed to be relevant back in quotidian the concerns. Now the second part. The second part is just a philosophical insight. Let us take an example. Let us have a look on a philosophical consideration that seems to be instructive for us in many respects. Let us have a look on a passage in a famous book of Hannah Arendt, which is entitled The Origins of Totalitarianism. This book was first published in New York in 1951. And in 1955, the extended German translation was released. The German title is Elemente und Ursprünge totalitärer Herrschaft. This book is about two extreme forms of political government, governance or leadership, about the dictatorship of the Nazis and uh, the one of the Bolsheviks, or rather of Hitler and Stalin. <coughs> Hannah Arendt was born in 1906, nearby the city of Hanover. She studied philosophy with Martin Heidegger and Karl Jaspers. 
as a Jewess. She left Germany in 1933 and finally in 1941 arrived in New York where she died in 1975. Referring to the above mentions, we can say that her soul was highly educated. Her culture of thinking was devoted to fathom out the fundaments of what a community and what politics are supposed to be essentially, and thus to understand the innermost structures of concrete historical situations. Now, totalitarianism depends on a massive organization from which no detail may escape. One of the means to this end is totalitarian propaganda. Techniques of mass propaganda were first developed about 1928, namely by Edward Bernays in his book Propaganda, the Art of Public Relation, and later, for instance, in 1939, by Hans Domitzlaff and his Die Gewinnung des öffentlichen Vertrauens, or in English, How to Obtain Public Trust. Both Bernays as well as Domitzlaff were guided by the economic interest to increase the profit of business companies. After the Second World War, these theories continued to have an impact on many a campaign trying to obtain the trust of the masses. masses. Today we do no more speak of masses of people, because this would be politically incorrect. We are rather speaking of a crowd, or simply of people, a great number of people. But what is called people in this way may finally be addressed by publicity. A publicity which, in terms of policy, becomes an indispensable in, in, uh, instrument of populists. And it is just in this perspective that I propose to read an extract of a chapter of Hannah Arendt, The Origins of Totalitar Totalitarianism. The chapter is entitled Totalitarian Propaganda. Although she does not really speak of populism or populist, the structure, her insight into totalitarian propaganda, lays open is still to encounter today, such as in the following case. Not long ago, a representative of a German populist party said, I quote, Islam by itself is a political ideology which is not compatible with the constitution, end of quote. And a like-minded member of the same party stated, I quote, Islam is not a religion such as the Catholic or Protestant Christianism, but which is intellectually always related to the takeover of the state. This is why the Islamization of Germany is a danger, end of quote. Now let us see how Hannah Arendt, with her cultivated soul, and out of her philosophical withdrawal meets with statements like this. In the mentioned chapter, we can read a quote, and it's a longer quote. She says, what distinguishes the populist leaders is rather the simple-minded, single-minded purposefulness with which they choose those elements from existing ideologies which are best fitted to become the fundaments of another entirely, entirely fictitious world, their art consists in using and at the same time transcending the elements of reality of verifiable experiences in the chosen fiction and in generalizing them into regions which then are definitely removed from all possible control by individual experience. With such generalizations, populist propaganda establishes a world fit to compete with a real one, whose main handicap is that it is not logical, but consistent and organized. The consistency of the fiction and strictness of the organization make it possible for the generalization eventually to survive the explosion of more specific lies." End of quote. Such leaders are characterized by a simple-minded, single-minded purposefulness with which they choose elements from exi existing reality which are best fitted to become the fundaments of another entirely fictitious world. 
That is to say, they choose elements of something that is already objectively existing and thus is a part of factual reality. These elements are chosen for the purpose of serving as a fundament, but not for establishing something that should be objectively existing in the same way as something in factual reality, but that in contrast is detracted from any possibility of being revisable. Lacking the possibility of verification, these elements are no more part of a reliable and proven world, but transferred into, into a fictitious one where they are furthermore generalized. Beyond that, they are now presented as not being simply cases, but as if they were overall principles. Such generalization misses any possible counterpart in the concrete reality, reality which is the only region to experience any being. This purely fictitious world now is fit to compete with a real one. And in the extended German version of her book, Hannah Arendt adds that this fictitious world not only would be fit to compete with the world of experiences, but even is supposed to excel it for fiction is removed from all common sense and judgment. That is to say that our discernible and observable world will never ever be as consistent and logical with the construction of fiction and thereby will always succumb. <clears throat> Let us now look a bit closer on the mentioned populist statements which uh, say that Islam would not be a religion but a political ideology. A political ideology is something all-embracing that claims exclusive and universal significance. Calling Islam a political ideology, on one hand, is an imputation, and on the other hand, the denial of its being as a religion, because neither politics nor ideology are as such a religion. Now, all those who call Islam a religion in the perspective of uh, po populists, um, raise a false claim. I, 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 I take it back. Now, all those who call Islam a re uh, religion raise, in the populist perspective, a false claim, and by that, attack real and true religions, which here means Christian religions. This prediction is at the same time unfounded and categorical. Unfounded because there is not the merest concrete hint to what this statement draws upon. Categorical because it defines what Islam essentially is, thus defines its general being. Statements like this assign and reject being. By removing Islam from the sphere of religion, this assignment transfers it into the sphere of politics, where it is now isolated from all context of belief. Even if there would be aspects which may have a political character, this does not mean in any way that such cases may be declared to be a principle and the only spirit of Islam. The assumption of a political ideology excludes all other moments of Islam, moments which are nevertheless essential. And by leaving them aside, this projection overrides the necessity of, a detecting, of detecting these moments, of discerning and referring them to one another. However, this excluding and restrictive proceeding is indispensable to establish a consistent and logical image easy to handle. Not explicitly said, but yet to be heard, is another assumption which operates as follows. As an ideology, there must be a kind of logic in the ideas of Islam which implies a congruity and finality that again is simply insuniated. But in this way, the consistency and logic of populist statements is able to confront itself with an adversary logic 
and its in in intrinsic attacks. In the end, this results in the fictitious construction of an adversary and hostile image in order to mobilize the crowd, pursuing the goal of devastating and annihilating anything consistent, anything stable, anything established, and last but not least, the so-called establishment. Carrying out this annihilation is nothing but nihilism. That is to say, the overcoming of what is existing, the overcoming of all what is, the overcoming of being itself. Populist imputations assign and deny being, pretending to be able to rule being itself. Thus, the most important enemy of populism is just that being which has to be annihilated as far as possible. With Hannah Arendt, we can see that the decisive features of populism incorpor uh, are incorporated in nihilism. Thanks to Hannah Arendt, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>